We're going to get started. I'm going to start to introduce the uh, panelists for today. Um, we'll start with uh, Steve Barber from Upstream, uh, Lauren Lynn from uh, Luxor, Matt Lostro from Giga, and Taylor Monig from CleanSpark. So come on up, guys. Test, test. All right. So our topic today is on cooling. Uh, as Meg said, uh, probably, <laughs> probably a very appropriate topic for, for this room today. Um, I think just a little bit of history for those of you who maybe are, are less familiar with this topic in this area. So the mining world over the last really four years has seen a pretty dramatic change in the thermal profiles of the machines that we use. Um, if you go back to the S9, that was about a 1,000-watt machine. Then the S17, about a 2,000-watt machine. Then the S19 brought us to the 3,000-watt level. And now we're seeing machines um, up in even the 5,000-watt level in some cases. And so that presents a lot of problems and trade-offs and decisions for us in the mining business. And uh, we're going we're gonna to talk through some of that today. Now, there's primarily three different methods that people use for cooling, air cooling, hydro cooling, and immersion. Uh, and, and we're going to kind of get into talking about what some of those trade-offs are. Um, Steve, since you're to my left, uh, you, you're kind of known for being an uh, air cooling maximalist. Am I? Yes. Am I? Okay. And so um, maybe we'll start with, but I'll ask you to maybe just quickly describe the, the three different methods to people and then give a, a brief description of why you primarily are focused on air. Well, I guess uh, I've always said everything is cooled by air on earth. So uh, whether you're hydro, water, or direct air, it's all, in the end, it's all dissipating into the air and then radiated off the planet. Um, I guess a brief on the three is uh, air cooling is direct air to heat sink. So obviously pumping air through that rig and, and cooling it that way. It's the most, uh, call it the simplest form of cooling. I mean, you're just using the ambient uh, liquid surrounding us to cool the chip. So, you, so of course, like the industry is dominated by air cooling uh, historically. Uh, immersion... Uh, is, of course, submersing it into the fluid. It, it arguably is the most efficient way to transfer the heat from the chip because you're literally immersed in it, right? So it's, it's direct to chip. Uh, even though the fluid isn't maybe as uh, efficient as water itself, but you can't immerse in water. So you immerse in this, uh, you know, uh, dialectic fluid that, uh, you know, won't short your boards. And then, of course, water is more what you see. Like, I have a gaming rig at home. It has pumped water through a, a, a cooling plate, basically, adhered to the chip. Um, all, all systems, like, have different orders of complexity. I, I consider immersion the most complex, but it has certain trade-offs. Taylor can get into that. Um, uh, for me, though, I mean, you say I'm an air-cooled maximalist. I, I sort of see, like, currently the market is mostly air-cooled, so, of course, you got to offer a great air-cooled product. So that's why my mind is always focused on making a better and better product. If you've seen my products, uh, you, you would have noticed, like, if you've, if you've seen what we have built since uh, 2017, you, you will see a constant iteration of, like, small changes and big changes in how we do our uh, air-cooling systems. I mean, the first one I did was a standard, you know, C-can build, air, air in one side, out the other kind of deal. And we've sort of, over time, iterated on that to do things a little, what I would say, a little better. Like, we now do, we now push air into the building. So the building's on positive pressure instead of on a vacuum. There's certain advantages to that. Uh, if you look at all of our products, for example, they all have heat recirc because I build for northern Canada and for, like, Texas, you don't need to heat research maybe in Texas unless it's humid, but you do need it in northern Canada. So we try to build a product that's sort of one size fits all. And that infrastructure is the simplest. It's not going away. Uh, no matter where immersion or water cooling goes, air cooling is going to stick around. 
Uh, just because it's, uh, it's the lowest CapEx, it'll always be the lowest CapEx option. And one thing I find that the market generally, especially in the bull run when everyone was talking about immersion as the bet, you know, this is what, this is the future or whatever. Uh, it definitely has its place. But for me, um, if you look at the, the, every successive generation of, of uh, minor, like shoebox, you know, since the S1 through the S9, through the S19 now, and the Watts miners, of course, they, they've constantly gotten better, more reliable. Uh, like you, you go from like these individual chips to these slabs. And so you see higher reliability. The problem with air cooling is uh, what I think the biggest problem with air cooling is from a reliability standpoint, uh, when you're in harsh environments like bugs coming into your building. I mean, if anyone has been to the mining game and you imported S9s from China back in the day, you would have had S9s full of dirt. I've had miners full of coal dust because they were in coal mines, literally in coal shafts, mining Bitcoin. Um, and that can cause problems, of course. So for me, like I, I see a trend towards air cooling. Um, mining machines have uh, constantly gotten more uh, reliable. And that to me is one of the biggest things that is often overlooked is reliability of the machine. So. I see the future uh, with, I, th I think that trend will continue, that where air-cooled machines continue to become more reliable. And therefore, like the alternatives, which have their own upsides, and I won't, I won't hog, the, hog the time, but the, uh, the upsides, some of the upsides that they bring, say, for example, just environmental protection, like an immersed rig or an, a water-cooled rig, fully enclosed, can be put anywhere, and you pump the heat out to a radiator, that's very valuable, like so that you're not having to fix your machines all the time if there's a catastrophe. I mean, we've had catastrophes galore where our customers set our stuff up, rip the filters out, and all of a sudden the building's full of snow. Uh, so there's a reason why, like right now, for example, when we recommend our customers buy that, that buy our rigs, when, they're, when we recommend a, uh, an ASIC, like a, a miner to pair with it, I'm usually recommending Watts miners because we've seen and had the most success on reliability in that in that model. But yeah, I'll well, stop. Maybe there. maybe with their um, kind of to offer uh, maybe a, a little different perspective. Taylor, on the other end, I think you and CleanSpark are well known for um, the work that you've done with immersion and the investments that you've made in immersion, and maybe highlight for us, you know, why you've been so focused on it. Um, versus taking the air cool path? Yeah, no, immersion just has a, a, a ton of benefits, you know, starting with reliability, right? Um, the miners just last forever in, in immersion. You know, they're going to last longer than they're going to be profitable, which is definitely like an interesting deal. It also just comes down to performance, right? As soon as you take away, like my background is in mechanical engineering, you take away all the moving parts out of the machine when you go to immersion, all the fans, everything like that. And that just makes the miners uptime and the, the amount of parts that you need also greatly reduced, right? So with immersion, you can operate a, a site with, let's call it half the staff, um, you know, over the lifespan of a, let's call it three to four years, you'll use one fifth to one sixth the amount of parts when you're going through and using these machines. And when you are dunking them in oil, it's actually increasing the performance from a watts per terahash. The fan is removed and the temperatures are greatly reduced and the way that the heat is being transferred in immersion is a lot different than air. A good way for everybody to like visualize it in the crowd is you guys have all cooked at home, right? If you cook a pizza for your kids, you open up the oven, put it up to 450, slide your hand in, slide your hand out. There's no burn, right? But if you go through and boil water, which is half that temperature, you stick your hand in, there's instantly going to be third degree burns. And you're going to be on the way to the hospital, right? Those are the same concepts that are being used and applied in cooling those rigs. Um, and when you're able to have the heat transfer be completely like a contained the whole entire time. The temperatures are balanced. It allows you to do a lot of creative stuff with the miners. For example, our Norcross facility, we have a batch of you know 90s, two to 104 J pros running in there, and this is over about 5,000 machines. Uh, the average lot is you know 112 terahash, and the watts per terahash is 28 watts of terahash. So we're able to acquire both terahash gains on that side, getting a, a massive upside on our returns, and we're also able to reduce the amount of energy we're using as a whole, right? And I think people overcomplicate immersion cooling. If you look at even like a typical container design, right, you're going to see 14 fans, you know, all the motors, VFDs, everything that's involved in that. You know, we have two megawatts hooked up to one singular water pump, hooked up to one dry cooler that has a set of seven fans. So when you really just think about immersion in the sense of you're pushing fluid through your rigs rather than pushing air, it really like reduces the complexity. So I think a lot of people just overthink it. 
Um, and it's also nice too, because the costs are coming down, right? So that's another big reason why we've been focused on immersion is the real only drawback to this stuff is, well, it costs a little bit more than air cooling. Um, so we've been pushing really hard with a lot of our vendors and partners over the last year. Um, and we're, we're looking at deploying immersion in 2024 at you know the same amount or less than air cooling, which makes it extremely advantageous. So it's a reliability, it's a performance, and it's really just thinking about your mining operation from a, you know, an overall perspective, from the amount of people to the amount of parts to how long everything's gonna last. When you look at that in a complete picture, that's why we're big fans of immersion. We'll continue to you know, push down that path. Great, thank you. Um, Lauren, you at your position at Luxor have uh, the privilege to kind of see how the industry is moving. And so, um, over the last year or so, have you seen changes in the, the deployments and from a movement from uh, air cooling to either hydro or immersion? And what do you expect to happen over the next couple of years? Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, I think at Luxo ASIC Trading Desk, what we have been seeing, uh, we buy and sell Bitcoin ASICs and have so far moved around 12 exahash uh, worth of Bitcoin ASICs to over 20 different countries. However, I would say almost 100% are air, uh, air cooled models. Um, among these a, a, like air cooled models, we're seeing increasing um, people who ask about immersion cooling. And I would say right now it's about 3% of our trading volume is being modified or going to be set up in immersion cooling. We're not seeing much volume for hydro. I think it's mainly because this mainly happens on the OEM markets instead of secondary market. Um, as Steve mentioned, I think this is mainly because from a CapEx perspective, air cooled is the most capital efficient and it only costs uh, 250 to 280K uh, uh, dollar per megawatts in setup. Uh, operating is much easier. While hydro, it's about like a 300 to 350K per megawatts. While you need to add a lot more in operating costs as well, since there's a lot more data and also parts of the setup to, to monitor. So I think overall, from uh, our trading desk, uh, air cooled is the majority. Immersion is increasing. However, hydro is still, um, uh, it, it, I, I think it's still at the education period uh, for miners to uh, adopt this new cooling technology. Uh, Matt, so uh, Giga is uh, one of the more vertically integrated companies in the industry. Um, so you get to look at this from, I think, multiple perspectives. But let's start with the container side. Um, I guess much like uh, Lauren's question, have you seen a change in the last year uh, in demand for air-cooled containers versus immersion? And do you expect that to change in the next year or so? Yeah, so um, Yiga is, is vertically integrated on the operations as well as the product side. Um, all of our own products that we produce uh, and sell, we use ourselves uh, and have been developed out of need just organically uh, over the past four or four and a half years. Uh, so we've produced about 150 megawatts of air-cooled containers uh, to date. Uh, and as we can kind of continue to pr produce our equipment uh, and expand you know, into harsher and harsher environments, uh, we have seen a demand for hydro uh, more than usual. And so kind of there's been, um, for people in the room that don't know, uh, with Bitmain, they, they didn't have the most stellar reputation in terms of rolling out that technology. Uh, a lot of people had bad taste in their mouth in terms of how they were uh, doing that cooling. Uh, it was through essentially uh, evaporative cooling towers uh, where you have um, more of an open loop system. And so uh, the industry is starting to move away from that uh, with what's minor and the M33 and 53. Uh, that they've produced uh, can be applied in a closed loop application, which means you know you can keep the same water in there and continue to use it on loop uh, with a dry cooler. Uh, and so there has been a significant uptick in that in terms of operational issues uh, finally being overcome and a higher and higher quality uh, specific ASICs uh, being built uh, for those cooling applications of what we've seen. And is it is it changing? Uh, are you are you having to do things? And I can throw this to you too, Steve, because you're in the. When you look at designing containers, immersion containers versus air cold, there's some obvious changes. But um, what, what what sort of engineering or operational uh, obstacles uh, are you over overcoming? <coughs> um. 
Well, for us, uh, right now we offer our air and water products. The one issue that, one reason, which is sort of not really anything against immersion, that I didn't put efforts into developing an immersion product, it's because our, our, our base market, like our, our bulk customers, are off grid oil and gas companies. And it is quite a lot more significant to deploy an immersion rig in an oil and gas off-grid environment. Uh, while it does have advantages, like the reliability aspect, um, you know, moving around tanks, which are usually usually need to be drained. Uh, I mean, again, this is not not technology we've put pushed into. But when you look at what has been on the market, I've had talks with immersion uh, manufacturers in the past about maybe integrating their stuff, but um, part of the issue is just the, the logistics of moving them around is a lot more complex besides the capital, you know, the upfront capex. So, I mean, if you had these oil companies, especially in Canada, uh, if you have even like a little bit of a spill on their lease, it's a, it's a reportable spill. It's a big deal. Um, it goes straight to the CEO. Uh, even if it's inert, like even if it's like, uh, you know, the data sheet on the fluid is, you know, benign, they don't care. It's a reportable spill. Now that now that that mentality will differ in jurisdictions like Texas is a little more cowboy. I mean, I, I remember the first time I had some Texans come up and check my stuff out in 2018. They were amazed that I had to, that I forced them to put on PPE like coveralls and hard steel toe boots and hard hat. No one gives a shit down there for that for that kind of thing, or at least it's not so uh, strict. Whereas in Canada, you if you're not clean shaven, if you have a beard, if you you know if you don't have this stuff, it's just a it's a different you know. There's a lot of rules uh, in the, in my backyard, so that that actually affects like you know how our decision on like not doing say uh, immersion, whereas say water for example in a closed loop contained system, we also integrate the micro BT. Uh, they got a beautiful uh, water cooling system. It's a lot easier for us to integrate. And if there is a catastrophe, you know, a hose breaks and there's a spill, it doesn't matter. It's just distilled water, maybe cut with uh, glycol for antifreeze and stuff like that. But it's no big deal. Uh, so I can actually deploy that at scale. And, and that's part of the reason why I went to water instead of immersion. Because even if they were, if they, everything was equal between them, like, if, you know, efficiency, life cycle cost, capex, opex, because what we have found with our water rigs, uh, we started building them uh, in 2022. Um, they do offer a lot of benefits. Like uh, there's less uh, operator intervention required on site if they're running well. Um, but we've also seen some bugs because it's a new, it's like a newer scaled technology. I know, I mean, I know water cooling plates been around for a long time, but at this power density, at this scale, uh, it does. It is all reasonably new, and there are you know bumps in the road as it gets developed. So we've uh, you know when you see our like we're getting our website updated and stuff, and you'll see that we're all about air and water, and water is an option. But I still I still push air on our customers because lower capex, and we're seeing better and better reliability. Like there's a stark difference between say for example uh, we build this product called a hash generator. It's a gen set with an air uh, air or water cooled rig. There's a stark difference between performance of that exact same unit uh, if you threw older models in, like Ant Miner S9s or uh, Watts Miner M30s. Uh, Ant Miner S9s just don't have, even though they're like the AK47, as they say, of the mining world, they don't have the reliability of the newer generation of ASICs. And, and S19s have gotten a lot better too, but they're still like, I think they, they, can do a few more things to improve it. That's why I don't really buy or deploy S19s because I, I don't want to deal with the headaches of aftermarket services repair and all that kind of stuff. Well, one thing, Bob, to kind of touch on that yeah, point go. between air-cooled and, and hydro too, uh, is on the power density side when building out the electrical, uh, right? As Taylor alluded to, you, there's a lot of overclocking that goes into place. And so uh, having to design systems that uh, can run in you know, normal power mode and then high performance mode. Uh, you know, you can have singular uh, computers running 10 kilowatts. And so that has a lot of implications in terms of having to put extra cost in uh, on the electrical side. The main breakers are bigger as opposed to a small 125 amp, you may be using a 600 amp. Uh, you know, breaker sizes, they start to go up uh, non-linearly uh, in cost. And so there's a lot of uh, differences on that end too. 
Yeah, that's a great point. Did you have a comment, Lauren? Yeah, just add on Steve's comment on the hardware design. There's still areas for improvement, even for the S19 series. Um, we noticed that the from a hardware design perspective, we're we're observing like less and less chips in the later S19 models. For example, the S19 J Pro, they have uh, 126 chips, and starting with the J Pro Plus and XP, we're observing 110 and 120 chips. And the latest model, S19 K Pro, is it only has 77 chips. So fewer and fewer chips definitely reduce the heat accumulation within the machines as well. So we are really looking forward to like what kind of um, cooling or thermal management uh, new designs will happen for the new upcoming model S21. So. Yeah, thank you. I, um, for those of you who don't know me, my, my background's in actually computer design. Um, I spent most of my career in personal computer design, and I've always struggled using the technology that we use because I, I frankly don't find it very well designed. Um, Taylor, you, you've done a lot of this work in immersion. If you, if you had a clean slate and you could create your own machine from scratch, what are maybe some of the key characteristics that you would change in the system design? Yeah, I think, you know, What's Minor did a really good job with the M56 series, basically like shrinking it down, making it a lot more power dense. But I think where we really get to like some of the major advantages are actually at the system level with the tank. Um, so if like I had a perfect world, the tank would be integrated with a certain number of hash cards all built onto one controller off of one power supply. So that way we can make everything a lot more simplified. We built a system like that in 2017. It was really successful and was hoping to see more and more like innovation towards that path and away from the whole single miner deal. But yeah, a backplane system with a single controller, single power supply, powering a whole set of cards and then being able to space those cards proportionally to the wattage of the cards, right? Um, and depending on which type of immersion that you're using. So the M56, I think, was a really good example for single phase. Um, but we can actually push all those limits, all those bounds a lot farther in two phase immersion cooling, which is where the fluid actually changes phases from a fluid to a gas and from a gas back to a fluid. Um, for example, you can put cards that are over a thousand watts a piece, just a millimeter apart with boilerplates and have them run. So a site that was, you know, 100 square feet could be shrunk all the way down to about 10 square feet, ran off one controller, one power supply, and it's nice too to have that advantage on scaling the overclocking and underclocking, having it all be simplified, because when you're managing, you know, 100,000 machines, being able to do it on, you know, less and less controllers, less and less power supplies, worry about swapping out, and then also building in redundancy, right? There's no reason why the power supplies need to be one-to-one. -one. You can make a power supply bank with multiple cells, where if one cell goes bad, that cell can be swapped out, but back in with no change to the actual rig running. So, you know, you come from personal computer design, I come from more of a data center type um, background and it would be nice to see more of like a closer merge happen between the data center world and the Bitcoin world. I think what a lot of people don't realize when they come into this industry is computers were never supposed to be ran outside with no humidity control, no air conditioning, very little filtration, right? From if, whether you're in a container or a building, we've all been to these Bitcoin mines. They're not tier three data centers where all these computers are actually designed to live in. And immersion is like the closest thing you can get at a reasonable cost to getting near like a tier three data center as far as controlling the environment in which your machine's in. So like, I'd like to see a convergence of those. And I think we're starting to see it with like the M53 and the server chassis design and things like that. But there's a lot more than just putting it in like a cooler form factor that we can do to really like progress the industry back. I encourage everybody to look at some of the work Bitfury did in 2015 and 16 on their two base deployment. I think it was like 10 years ahead of the time. It worked really well, but um, no one's really like caught back up to that level of innovation since. Yeah, I will say uh, to the Bitfury stuff, we uh, are probably the only ones, but we, we actually continue to use it. We actually deployed a little bit even this year. Somebody may even know they still make them, but they still have that 19-inch 6U rack-mounted design. And But it's it's not the greatest thermal profile, but you can get like a, a little under a 200 tera hash per second unit that um, gen it's about 6,300 watts, but very serviceable very, you know, we, we, we really had good luck with it from a reliability standpoint. <clears throat> One thing I just wanted to comment on is uh, yesterday at that the, the VIP mining event, I was talking about not really on the cooling side, but on the commodity side of how I made a comparison of how, you know, we're still in this early phase of Bitcoin mining uh, where I'll, I'll, every every kind of every air immersion and water, there's still massive improvements being made on all uh, sides of the cooling 
uh, of all three. I compared it to the engine world. Okay, the engine world is 300 years old and it's become a very mature technology. Now there's still improvements being made. So I, I, yesterday I was talking about the commoditization of like engines and, and, and how ASICs and, and these computers are sort of trending in the same direction. I was relating it to a different uh, point, but the point I'm making now, if you look at early engine uh, technology, all early engines were cooled by air. As engine technology became more power dense and compact and it turned from external combustion steam engines invented by James Watt and all the iterations they made up to the internal combustion engine, even early internal combustion engines were air cooled. Even a lot of engines today are air cooled, like uh, all kinds of uh, small applications and, and engines used in, air, in aerospace. Now, um, one of the key distinctions is power density. Uh, in the Bitcoin mining world, it's all about efficiency. Chip efficiency is number one, okay? If, if chip efficiency can be maintained at higher temperatures, because generally when you overclock, you lose efficiency. That's historically what we see. When you start overclocking, you lose uh, just uh, uh, joules per terahash efficiency in the miner. So overclocking is generally reserved for bull markets or other uh, niche needs. Like if you have surplus power, you might as well overclock, right? But I would, I would expect to see a complete switch from like air cooling being mostly obsolete if uh, these chips can be developed to be peak efficiency at higher temperatures. The higher the temperature it is, the more it makes sense for immersion and water cooling versus air. Because at that point, you have much smaller dry coolers, much smaller radiators, because you're pumping a uh, higher delta T through that uh, exchange system. The, the dry cooler is actually one of the, the worst parts of uh, my, my view of, of because uh, what could be a very compact, awesome, say water cooling package right now, we have to bolt on this expensive, heavy, bulky uh, dry cooler. If the chip temps can, if they can keep developing chips temp, chip temps, which MicroBT is, is working on some uh, new iterations to make that efficiency at a higher temperature, but if that can keep, get, keep going higher, I would expect to see air cooling go obsolete because at that point, um, maybe because maybe because the air cooling couldn't handle that delta T at that point. Uh, whereas direct uh, immersion or direct uh, uh, water, pumping water across the sink would start to have a much better bang for the buck. So that's just something to watch. Like if, if, the, if the technology continues to develop, but it has to start with efficiency. If it's not efficient, it's just not gonna last because you're gonna be you know, uh, it, energy prices are still number one, right? And I and that's only going to be the the case in the future. I don't see that changing. It's all going to be opex driven. But uh, it's something I'm watching. Like if they can, I've always sort of said, if you can develop uh, if the same efficiency level but at a higher temp, now you're going to start to see. A, I, I know I'd be planning to swing into more water at that point because now the dry coolers are, are just look at an engine, right? Like an engine. Uh, they operate at so much higher uh, coolant temperatures that they can have a much shrunk uh, radiator system and still cool uh, that heat load. Whereas right now you need a massive dry cooler to cool that heat load and, and the, ambient temp the ambient air temperature is a major factor in that because you have to have that delta T, right, to exchange heat. So if we see that tech continue to progress, I could see air cooling go completely obsolete and that's, part that's why I'm not willing uh, to not invest in an alternative to air, even though I presently, uh, I would say presently the market, I'm more interested in continuing to develop air. Well, I think one thing that's going on is the, the Bitcoin industry has been chasing chip efficiency for a while. Um, and so we've lagged, let's say the personal computer market where I came from or GP, the GPU market, but we're now seeing that almost all the chips in these latest generations are coming off the latest fabs. And so what that means is that system efficiency is not going to come from these rapid chip iterations, but instead from system design. So I think you're, you're correct that it will shift the innovation point uh, from the silicon to the, to the system. And then we'll see the analogous of your radiator designs. And bear in mind, I mean, the higher that delta T goes, the more useful the heat becomes, right? Uh, if, if you could have, 
you know, in oil field, like, you know, can you use the heat of a mine in the oil field? Well, no, because you need an engine and the engine has more useful heat. So you use the engine heat first before you use the mine's heat, right? Like the heat off the chip, you'll use the heat off the engine before you do that. And we do that all the time in oil field. We use it for heat trace, like uh, glycol loops to heat, uh, keep the flow lines warm uh, and that kind of thing. So, I mean, even in, in, when we talk about like using the, like the, pr the prior panel on home mining, if, when we're talking about useful heat, uh, it's really important that these chips become more power dense and higher, higher delta T because that becomes more and more useful as that happens. Yeah, let me, uh, did you have something to say, Taylor? Well, yeah, I was gonna say, the, I think the other thing that'll push us more towards what's, push us more towards liquids, and I, I'm happy that you mentioned it, is like Porsche, right? Porsche was the air-cooled maxi forever. As soon as they got into the early, I think it was like 1990s, maybe 2000s era, they all went water-cooled to keep driving efficiency. And, I, and the one thing I've got a little bit of controversial opinion on is I do think we'll continue to see chips become more and more efficient at a continually rapid rate, right? Right now we use ultraviolet lithography to make chips. That's how pretty much everything is produced, right? Intel has in, uh, invested billions of dollars into a new way of doing it that should be available around 2025 using extreme ultraviolet light. So I think, I know a lot of people think that Moore's law is dead and the chips are gonna continue to slow down and not be, you know, as a, a big of an increase, but I, I think we're still too soon for that. I think there's still a lot more innovation to be done at the transistor level and how we actually make the chips before we're gonna see a, a top out in that. And, and to kind of piggyback on it, right? Like the heat is increasing every single year. So if you look at Microsoft, Facebook, Google, all these companies that have research budgets that are larger than our market cap, right? They're all going to immersion cooling. They're all going to liquid cooling with their new AI and HPC. And we're actually lucky as an industry to be a little bit ahead of them on power density and having an understanding of how to cool these computers because they're in a little bit of a catch up mode right now, bringing some of the liquid to chip and immersion innovation back into the data center space at a really rapid rate due to this AI boom. Yeah, let me, we only have a few minutes left. Let me um, throw a hypothetical situation uh, at Matt and Lauren, um, like each of you to answer. So if we, if suddenly you had a customer call you, let's say Monday morning and say, hey, I've got a, I've got a two megawatt site. I want to be up in four months. I've got four cent energy. Um, I want to know your recommendation about what I should deploy. Air cold. Uh, if they're two megawatts, is their first time. I mean, yeah, most people don't know what they're doing. They need to be careful. Reduce the amount of capital at risk. Um, that's the easiest way to get up and going. You know, we can produce in, like 30 megawatts of air cooled data centers in about 35 days, right now, uh, in terms of our capacity. And so, I, yeah, that, that's what I would recommend. I, I would say it depends, but from personal preference, I, I would say air cooled as well, um, due to the. Like a deployment timeline and also also depending on the client's budget as well. But what else we can help with um, thermal management is from a software perspective. Um, for example, right now a lot of minor management software and the firmware, they can uh, perform very, very efficiently um, and react to like a, a big temperature variance. For example, uh, our own firmware, uh, it can automatically overclock the machines when the temperature is low and then underclock the machines when uh, the machine is over, almost overheated. So I, I feel like from a, a knowledge perspective, experience perspective, and also um, the setup timeline, also the software services we can help to manage the thermal, I would recommend air cool as well. But I do think uh, exploring the new technology in the immersion cooling space and try to make, it's, it's all about efficiency. So it's it, it worth the investment if the client wants to explore different cooling uh, technologies to just to get prepared when we head into uh, having, just get to uh, prepare that to make their operations more efficient and more profitable. And one thing I think too that, and it seems intuitive when you start to see it, but liquid, whether it be hydro, cold plate cooling, uh, or immersion is best in a uh, more larger scale uh, operations. You get a lot more efficiencies, whether you're using one dry cooler to power multiple uh, tanks, um, you don't even have to use, you know, uh, a heat transfer of liquid to air, right? You could still go uh, liquid to liquid. Um, cooling lakes are a thing and have been a thing uh, with plants over the years, and that cuts down on a tremendous amount of capital. Uh, so I think from a small individual minor basis, especially just leaving out the externalities of they're going to screw something up, but just from uh, economies of scale, uh, air cooled, in my opinion, anything below. Um, five megawatts, unless you have a very, very specific application, should stay at air cool. 
Okay. Well, I think we're out of time. Thank you all. Thank you, panelists, for uh, very insightful thoughts. Thank you. Oh, hi. Do you have your ticket to the next Pacific Bitcoin Festival? Join us as we shine a light on the best of Bitcoin and Bitcoiners. Visit PacificBitcoin.com for the best deal on tickets now. Oh.